Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 40 in a Bible study that I've entitled, A Church That Is Well. And we're actually going to use the word well, W-E-L-L, as an acronym to remember four important ingredients to a strong, healthy, vibrant church. Because it's true, isn't it? We all want to be a part of a healthy, balanced, vibrant, strong church. Some people would even say, oh yeah, not only do I want to be in a strong church, I want, to, I want to find the perfect church. But by now, you know that there is no such thing. There is no perfect church because the church is filled with imperfect people like you and me. But I know this for sure. We're not interested in being a part of a church that's unhealthy, that's unbiblical. We don't want to be a part of a church that's harmful or imbalanced. We, we want to be a part of the church that Jesus is building that he is the chief shepherd, that we look past man and methods and programs and we look to Jesus high and lifted up to the best of our ability in humanity. We want to be a part of the the church that Jesus promised to build in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And also I say this to you that you're Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And we learn in the book of Acts God's prescription for spiritual health. If we want to know what the church should look like and what God's desire for his church is, we turn to the book of Acts. And I believe God's prescription for a healthy church is greatly needed today in our culture. And it's important for us to choose to get back to basics, to get back to simplicity, and then stay there. It takes a lot of energy and effort to work towards simplicity because it's easier to make things complex. It's easier to muddy up the waters. And we have done a good job of that over the years as humans. We just make things hard and complex and we need to fight for simplicity, returning back to simplicity, a simple walk with Jesus. We want to see the church going back to a healthy place that we would be well and do well and progress well and serve well and impact our community well. I mean, really, if you want to think of the simplicity of any church family, it's this. You love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. That's as simple as it gets. That's a true, real love relationship with God that turns into a love relationship with our neighbor. Christianity doesn't need to be repackaged as some are trying today or reworked or redone or reinvented or deconstructed or any of those things. But I do believe individually we need to reevaluate it from time to time. We need to ask the question, hey, are we doing it right? Is what we're doing biblical? Is there any biblical basis for the choices we're making and the decisions we're making? Did the Lord really lead us to do that? And then if we say, well, yeah, I think the Lord led us to do it, does it fit with the construct, con- the, the construct of the scriptures? Is it what God has for us in this time? So while I don't think it needs to be repackaged or reworked, I do think we need to reevaluate the church from time to time. And certainly God is asking us to reevaluate our church. He's asking us to reevaluate our lives. He's asking us to reevaluate our families, our homes, the direction of our life for the days in which we live. I'm telling you, status quo is not going to reach the world as it exists today. Just going through the motions and being religious and being a church attender and just coming in, sitting down and leaving, coming, that that isn't going to reach the world. That's not going to be the the type of, and you, you find that that's not what happened in the book of Acts. They weren't just simply attenders of a church. Jesus was their life. It was everything about them. Now, they were imperfect. They stumbled along the way. Again, Jesus being our life is going to make us progress a little faster. But man, the the idea of just being religious and going through the motions, you know, the world doesn't need that. They have enough phoniness already. 
There's enough hypocrisy and phoniness in the world today that they don't need a group of people that would say, no, we're different. We love Jesus. We, we trust him with our lives. And then to live hypocritical, you know, compromising lives ourselves. Now, here in the book of Acts, we have a church, the early church, the infant church. I mean, we're talking just, we're just talking moments after an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get to verse 42, you're going to see a phrase that's used in the book of Acts that kind of extends it over time when it says they continued steadfastly from the original language in the Greek. The tense of the verb has the idea that now this is how they progress forward. So it's not just a moment of time, but it's a series of moments in time of how God is going to progress them and send them off into the world in which they live. But I mean, in chapter two here, this is moments after the Spirit of God is poured upon them and how this is the essence of how they turn their world upside down. And because of their faithfulness, your world and my world was turned upside down. And we learned last time, one of the, one of the beautiful things about the early church is they just understood that Jesus was everything and that they belonged, that they had a purpose on the earth, that God saved them from something and now saved them to something. And it's the same for you. You've been rescued and delivered from something for something, to something, from something for something. And that would do well for you as you're in your prayer time to say, okay, God, I realize it. You've reached me. You've spoken to me. You've saved me. you changed my family, changed my life. Now I'm ready. I'm ready to obey you. And every believer, it seemed, believed that they were called to do their part. They recognized that every person mattered and every person chose to serve the Lord. But I'll have to say, it's much easier, is it not, to sit on the sidelines, and instead of getting involved, it's easier to sit on the sidelines and be a critic. And it's easy, there's so many things to be critical about these days. We can be critical of the world, we can be critical of politics, we can be critical about crime, we can be critical about, yeah, you know, the church, even your own church. Sit around and find everything that's wrong with it, find everything that's not working, all the mistakes that might have been made, But I'm telling you, it's a totally different perspective when you're in the game. It's one thing to be in the stands. Like many of you might be heading off to the football game later today and you'll be in the stands and you'll watch the stands and you're like, oh, they should have done this and they should have done that. Why did they run this play? And you're just like such an expert on the game. Well, try putting on a uniform and going down and getting in the game. Then tell me how it goes. I mean, it's totally different, isn't it? When you are in the game, it's a completely different perspective. And I think it's true in Christianity. It's easy to sit around and go, oh, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, which may may be true. But from the perspective of being in the game, I'm inviting you today to get in the game, church. Get in the game. It was Teddy Roosevelt that said this, and I quote, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how a strong man stumbles or whether doer of deeds could have done better, The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again. Because there's no effort without error or shortcoming. But who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, And who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat, end quote. It is not the critic that counts. It's the one that's in the game. You know, we as a church, we have our shortcomings, we have our failures, we have our mistakes, but I encourage you to get in the game and make some mistakes with us. Step out in faith. Take a venture of faith. Try something. Rearrange your life in such a way where you are utterly dependent upon the Lord, where you have to trust Him for everything. And and yeah, maybe you don't know what you're doing. I'm not sure. I'm not. Well, yeah, just start walking by faith. Trust Him for the things you don't know. I'll tell you what, when you start to serve and you start to step in to these things, you know what will happen? Number one, you'll become more empathetic. Empathetic. Why? Why? Because as you make mistakes, you'll be empathetic with others that make mistakes because you know how it feels. Like, oh man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Oh, what happened? It happens all the time. 
But not only will you be empathetic, but secondly, you also learn to lean on the Holy Spirit for what? Patience. You start to be patient with people and appreciate them for where they're at and understand that you're not perfect, they're not perfect. You don't have it all together, they don't have it all together. And I, I like how in the New King James, they translate that Greek word for patience, they translate it long suffering, just like the word sounds, that you would suffer long with other people's mistakes and failures. That's the body of Christ. And the church today needs a lot more empathy and a lot more patience for each other and for a broken world. Serving the Lord will help you do that. Understanding your value. Now as we come to verse 40 in Acts chapter 2, notice it says in verse 40, with many other words he testified and exhorted them. This is Peter still saying, be safe from this twisted generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So by now, the church is not 120 people, but 3,120 people. God did a quick, fast, amazing work of salvation. Now, if we translated these numbers into today's world, you know, those that study the church and pay attention to the church, they have different categories for churches, you know, just like anything, they have categories and labels. And, and so the, there are those that study these things that say, well, there are small churches and there are medium churches and there are large churches. And then this category, 3,120, if a church is that size, the world today would call it a mega church. Those categories don't mean anything to God. Man might make up categories, but as we learned in our study last time, the size of your church is exactly what God wants it to be in that moment. And so it's, if it's small or large or mega church, none of that matters to God. That, that's not his deal. That's man's deal and how they measure it. But this is a large church, and it's going to pose some challenges here in the early days. There's going to be some difficulties. But as we learned, you know, I, God loves large churches. I love large churches, but we're a part of the large church, capital C. And no size church is insignificant. Every gathering of believers where two or three are gathered, Jesus says, I'm there. Every size matters to the Lord. But the size of this church isn't important as its health. Because as things get larger, you know, things get more complex and more difficult, and for churches, as churches grow, there's a great temptation to be unhealthy, to not continue how you started, where you started in the spirit, but now you're trying to perfect it in the flesh. It happens to every church, especially as they grow. It is important that we spend a lot of time working toward keeping things simple, so that we remain simply worshiping God in spirit and in truth. What's important is not the size as much as that God is the one doing the adding. Did you notice that? It, it, well, actually, we'll get to that at the end of verse 47. Let's read on in verse 42. He says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's a key ingredient to a healthy church is that the Lord is adding daily. Not the projects and programs and methods of man, but God is adding daily. He's the one that saves. And it's possible to have a large church but not be a strong church. It's possible to have a large church and not be a healthy church. You know, you can do a lot of things to draw a crowd. Filling a room is not challenging. Filling a room is easy. But just because a room is full doesn't make us the church. It's not about being big. Not in our church or in any church. It can't be. You, you just know you have taken a bad turn when all you care about is the size of your church. No, it's not about being big. It's about being strong and biblical. It's about staying the course and what God has called you to do. And even as we moved here so many years ago, my heart has remained the same. I, I, I'm not interested in 
anything more than what the Lord has for me as a pastor. I want to serve the people that are in front of me faithfully every single time I have the opportunity. Whether it's a large amount of numbers or it's one person at a time, it doesn't matter. Whoever's in front of me is the one that I want to serve the best. I want, I want you to be trained that same way. Don't be impressed by numbers. Don't be impressed by, oh, there's so many people. But also don't, be, don't panic when the numbers are smaller. <laughs> large numbers, smaller numbers, just give it unto the Lord. Let him sort it out. This is a time where God is adding to the church daily. And this is our prayer. Our prayer is that God would do the same thing here, that we would reach more for the gospel. I love that. that, that you've got to mark that. The Lord added to the church daily. Daily. So we're going to jump in now in verse 42, and we're going to dive in a little bit deeper, and we're going to use the word well, W-E-L-L, to identify four ingredients to a healthy church. So we're going to use each letter as an acronym to remember a word. Four ingredients. The W stands for worshiping. A healthy church is a worshiping church. The E will stand for evangelizing. A healthy church evangelizes and shares the gospel and loves their neighbor. The first L is going to be the word learning. That's what we're going to focus on today. A healthy church is a learning church. And then finally, the last L is a loving church. A healthy church is a loving church. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the biblical order so we actually aren't going to be able to spell the word well until the end. Because we're going to start with the first L right there in verse 42. Notice, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. A couple things before we jump in. First of all, the phrase continued steadfastly. If you'd like to write in your Bible, circle that phrase. Right next to it, habit. This describes the habit of their lives. This is a habit. You have habits, I have habits. The things that we do regularly and repetitively, often without thinking. This was what just came naturally for them. They woke up, this is what they did. They went to bed, this is what they did. This is what they chose to do in their new relationship with Jesus. They just continued. It wasn't start and stop, start and stop. They were stead. We we'll still use the English word today, steadfast. That's a great characteristic to have. Somebody that's trustworthy and reliable. And, and this is a trustworthy, reliable habit that the believers of the early church had. And what was that? They stayed in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine. They were a learning church. And this is something you'll see throughout the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit, using the word of God, depositing it in the hearts of the people of God to reach the world. And the first mark of a healthy church is their commitment wholeheartedly to the studying of God's word. And you think, wait a minute, Ed, what is the apostles' doctrine here? Because at this time, they don't have the Bible like you and I have the Bible today. The reason is, is that most of the Bible isn't written yet in Acts chapter 2. And you go, Ed, how do you know that? Well, if you read the book of Acts, you'll know it's not until chapter 9 that we meet this guy named Saul, who is in, has an encounter with God on the way to Damascus, and he's saved right there on the road to Damascus. Well, Paul, Saul, as he's also known as Paul, he's the one that wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament. And so here in Acts chapter 2, he's not even saved yet. So they don't have the books of the Bible. And again, you could also look at it chronologically. We're very early in. We're, we're right after the ascension of Christ. And, and the books of the Bible are written much later. Churches aren't even planted yet. So Corinth doesn't, the church in Corinth's not there yet. The church in Ephesus is not there yet. So they don't have the Bible as we have it. What do they have? Number one, what do they have? They have the Old Testament. That's what got them where they're at right now. The Old Testament is giving to you and me a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. I mean, whenever you're reading the Bible, you want to look for Jesus in the text. So they have the Old Testament, the Old Testament that predicted and prophesied the coming of Messiah. The Old Testament that gives the character and nature of God. And they're going to be studying through the Old Testament. And they also have the teachings of Jesus. And the apostles spent three years with Jesus so they're going steadfastly through the teachings of Jesus that the apostles would be repeating to them until, you know, the things that were written down, that's what they're, we have them written down now. Back then, they're going through them verbally. So they're continuing what we would call today the Bible. 
We study the Bible. That's how we apply it in our lives. We choose to make a habit of studying the Bible. And what's true for the church at large is true for the individual. If you are a spirit-filled Christian, you consider yourself that, then you are to be in the word of God. That, that there is no other way for you to grow than God's word. And if you have no interest in the Bible today, you call yourself a Christian, you say you're a believer in Christ, that you're born again, and you have no desire for the Bible, no interest in reading the Bible, you think Bible study is boring and reading the Bible is boring, then I am very concerned for you because those are not real marks of a believer. A believer wants to hear and know from God. Now, it's different where you might say, well, you know what, I'm just not a reader. Okay, that's different. But the desire to learn about God, the desire to hunger and thirst for God, to learn about what he wants you to do and who he wants you to be and how he wants you to live. And God, what is it that, why is it, you know, here I am, this little speck on this little speck of a planet and you love me and want to learn about that love. If you have no desire for that, I'm concerned for you. I would even go one step further and say, if you have no desire for the Bible and for reading the Bible, you are spiritually sick. That's signs of a sickness. You're not healthy. That's not a healthy place to be. Now, let me speak to that boring part for a moment. A moment. The Bible is not boring. But I do need to ask for forgiveness. And if in my teaching from time to time, I make it boring or other pastors make it boring, that's our fault. But the Bible is not boring. It is an amazing adventure. I mean, if you just can consider just walking with Jesus for a while, he's walking around, some guy comes up to him blind, he spits in the mud, makes mud, heals him. That's not boring. The dude got his sight back. Or, or there's someone that comes to him and says, no, you don't understand, you don't understand, I've been sick. This woman comes, I've been sick all this time. I've spent all my money. I've gone to everybody to help me. Boom, with just a touch of his, of his hem of his garment. She's healed. To me, that's not boring. When God's inter intervening in people's lives, changing them. You think of Zacchaeus, such a ripoff. He's such a thief, just taking advantage of his own people. Meets Jesus, his life is transformed forever. The Bible is not boring. It's not. Listen, if you're spiritually sick, it's time to repent. That, that is the right response. And just admit to God, you know, I've had no desire for your word, God. And I don't know what's wrong, with it, but I just want to give me a desire for your word. Start praying and asking God for a desire. Because if you want to be a Christian and part of a church that's going to impact this world, you've got to have the word of God in you. You have the word of God in you, but you also are in God's word. It will fashion and shape your mind. The Bible says of itself that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Faith comes by hearing and what? hearing by the word of God. And I'm not merely speaking about hearing sermons and other man, men talk about the Bible. I'm talking about you and the Holy Spirit in God's word. I'm not asking you to, to become, you know, start listening to way more sermons. I'm asking you to start reading the Bible for yourself, praying over it, asking God how to live it out. Maybe reading ahead in Acts and letting the Holy Spirit teach you before I ever get the chance to teach you where you're living out his word. Here's the, here's the important distinction we need to make in our culture today. You know, we as a church are committed to you. We're gonna teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. That's how we were trained. That's how we were discipled. And that's what I'll hand down to anyone I get a chance to train and disciple. We're gonna teach you the Bible. So that one day, one day I'll be able to stand before a congregation and say, I've not shunned to give you the whole counsel of God from verse one of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. Every word, every phrase, every section, and learn not only what does it say, but what does it mean, and then how do you live it out? That's basic Bible teaching. You, you, what does it say? We observe it. What does it mean? We come to the interpretation, and then how do you live it out? That's the application. And we're gonna do that with the Bible. As simple as possible. And we're committed to it. Why? Because in the world today, and even in the church world today, the modern trend is to abandon the Bible altogether, as if it's not needed anymore. I mean, there, there are popular pastors today, you can look it up for yourself, they're saying, oh, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. 
We're a new covenant church. We don't even need to look at the old. Well, they just dismiss more than two-thirds of the Bible just with a simple phrase. I mean, how can you do that? You've got a church of like 25,000 people. You've got a worldwide impact, and you're telling people to dismiss two-thirds of the Bible? What are you thinking? Like the Holy Spirit wrote the Old Testament just like he wrote the New Testament. And they're applicable to your life and mine. But that's happening today. Not only that, but there's a distinct difference, church, from teaching the Bible and occasionally using the Bible. There is a big difference. So you happen to be in a church that's committed to teach the Bible. And our methodology is verse by verse. We'll take you through. There are other methodologies to teach the Bible, but we've chosen verse by verse in, in, in our attempt to serve you in our community. Te- using the Bible or teaching from the Bible usually involves some kind of text, some kind of scripture that the pastor will use and then go off and talk about things that have nothing to do with the scripture, nothing to do with the context, nothing to do with, but they just kind of go on and tickle ears or whatever it is they're, they, they're choosing to do. And that's a danger because there's a lot of churches that do that. Do you know, did you know, you probably do, but did you know that you can buy sermons on the internet? I just downloaded mine last night at one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you for that courtesy, La. You know, you can buy whole sermon series. You can buy whole packages. You can buy whole books. You can buy, that's why when you're driving around town and you might see two churches and the artwork looks the same, they probably bought it from the same place. Same topic, same stuff. And they're all teaching someone else's stuff. And that's a travesty and a tragedy. And it's usually just a few of the same exact topics. Of course, at the end of the year, it's always a money topic or the beginning of the year, whenever they do their budget. And then there's the marriage series. And then there's how to be a good life series. And and then there is how, how to be married series. And then the real popular one in the last 10 years is what are the five most top, top, popular movies? And let's watch the movies and then figure out if there's any morality in the movies. And then maybe attach a scripture or two, but they talk more about movies than they do the word of God. That is not healthy. That is not a healthy thing to do. And I don't sit, I'm not God, I don't sit in judgment on any of those guys, but I do need to tell you the truth. The truth is that is not healthy. That is not good for you. Any parent or grandparent would understand that. That's the difference between a well-balanced meal and cotton candy. Like, yeah, you give your kids cotton candy every now and then if you, if you allow them to have sweets like that, but they can't live on cotton candy. It'll make them sick to their stomach. If they keep eating cotton candy, they won't have the nourishment that they need. They, they won't have the stamina or strength. Their bodies will, their growth will stunt. And you'll be in trouble as a parent. They will take you to jail for, mis- for abusing your kids by, well, what's, how'd they get like this? Oh, they just said they wanted cotton candy, so I gave it to them. No, you would never do that. But pastors and leaders today, that is the common trend. I know it may not be something that... that you even recognize, but in the world, the church world that I'm in, the pastor world that I'm in, this is so common. I get emails all the time. It used to be stuff in the mail now, but now it's an email. Pastor, 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 here it is. Grow your church, grow your church, grow your budget, build more buildings if you just do this. I've, I've, and, you know, just do this always includes 1999. It always includes some number of what, what they want from us, how they want us to invest. I, I never... I've never received an email that said, Pastor, 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 be faithful to God and teach the Bible. It costs nothing. And that's it. I've never received an email like that. But you're in a church that's committed to the word of God. And hopefully God will bless it. I know I'll have to answer to God at the Bema seat for it. And so I'm not just merely doing it because it's a part of the family I'm a a part of. I'm doing it because I think it's the right thing to do, to teach the Bible, begin and end. And not go against all the different trends. I've been around here now long enough in our community. I've seen a lot of trends come and go. And I've also seen a lot of churches come and go. And I've seen a lot of church plants come and go where, man, it's just so sad. If you're going to have a church, just teach them the Bible and love them. Teach them how to love God. Teach them how to love their neighbor. You know, have sermons. You're going to get a sermon here. We, we, I'm going to teach probably about 45 minutes or so. I have a timer here. I don't pay much attention to it, but it's getting to the end here. I have a timer. I've got a clock on the back wall. 
But I'll tell you what I think about the most is we've got kiddos downstairs. We have Sunday school teachers down there. We don't want them there all that. So I have that in my mind, but I'm committed in working with Pastor Ian to teach for a good 45 minutes. That, that's our commitment. Uh, it, if, if I have longer, I'll use longer. But I want to teach in such a way where I'll give you the sense of the scripture and then help you walk away. I want you to live this out. And at least in the 90 minutes I have of a service, and as we pray over the order of service, the preeminence will be upon the teaching of God's word. That will be the essence. That's what will change your life. We're not going to just have a talk and have a little dialogue or things that don't really give you the sum and substance. That's why the Bible says there's coming a day and that's when you come back to verse 42, that word doctrine, you could circle it. It just means teaching. Uh, so don't be afraid of that doctrine. just means teaching. And then Paul would tell young Timothy later on that there's coming a day when there will be those that can endure sound doctrine. Because when you teach through the Bible, you cover every topic. You cover everything. Popular things, not so popular things. Things that are happening in the culture, things that, that are uncomfortable, things on this is what the Bible says. And, and it reflects the culture. See, the culture thinks, you know, it looks like the culture is winning right now. That's not true. Culture never wins. Always has to submit itself to the word of God. And when you choose not to submit yourself to the word of God, you will pay the price for it. The consequences always come. And that's why people, that's why our heart has to go for the lost. Because if they don't know, or they've never experienced real love before through another believer, or they've never experienced the love of God before, that's why the church has to be the church. Where else are they going to get it? Where else will they possibly understand the love and character and nature of God if it isn't from the word of God in the hands of another believer? God uses people to reach people. That's his choice. So there's coming a day where, you know, you won't endure sound doctrine, but the Bible says they'll have itching ears and so what will they do, though? Heap up for themselves teachers. Why are these churches exist? Why are they so popular? Why do they get so full? It's predicted in the Bible. It's the same reason why when, our, when my ears are itching, I'm going to want to hear somebody that agrees with me. That I'll want to hear. I, I, there'll, be people, there'll be times where I will avoid Marie on purpose because I know she won't agree with me. I won't talk to her first because I already know what she's going to say. And so I got a process, but the people live that way with God. You could say, you know, I will avoid God because I already know what he thinks on that topic. I know. So now what are you going to do about it? You got to eventually talk to him and eventually yield your life to him and trust him with your life. You don't want to heap up for yourselves teachers that are always agreeing with you and your bad theology and your, no, you want the sound doctrine because it will change your life. Like, like if if you don't understand the character and nature of God, it'll be very hard for you to receive his comfort when you need his comfort. We think of it always as rebuke and teaching, but no, God is the God of all comfort who comforts us on all our tribulation. So it's a, it's a full package. God will tell you the truth, but he'll also tell you the truth when you're in pain. He'll also tell you the truth when you're afraid. He'll also tell you the truth when you're worried. He'll also tell you the truth. And, and he's, it's like not, not just the words, but his presence. He's with you in his presence. So we don't want to make it up. We don't want to lean on our own opinions. You don't, you don't need opinions. You need the truth of God's word. You don't need my opinion. The Bible is my authority. I get to stand here in the authority of God's word. And so the Bible is more important than me and more important than my words. That's why you take everything that I say and what? Test it by the word of God. It's not my opinion that matters. It's what God's opinion matters. And we need to learn what his opinion is from his word. So we as pastors, we've got to prepare well, pray well. I spend most of my week praying and preparing messages for this church. That's most of my week. Not all of it, but most of it. Because I think it was Alistair Begg said this, and I quote, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there will be a fog in the pews. I was like, man, that was good. Like, there's got to be clarity from the pulpit, so there's clarity in the pews. Clarity in your life. The Bible has answers for everything in life, and we need to teach it without apology. I don't apologize for the Bible. It says what it says. And I love God for telling me the truth about my life and telling me the truth. Like, I, that we don't need to apologize for the Bible. We teach it without hesitation. For steady growth in Jesus, it's essential you follow the example of the early church. 
The habit of your life is to be a man or woman of God's word. Period. 100%. It needs to take the main place in our homes. It needs to take the main place in our churches. It needs to take the main place in our offices. I mean, I remember growing up, we had a Bible. We had a Bible in our house. It had all the flowers my mom was drying out, all of our birth certificates, and it was under the TV. It was a huge thing with a 3D picture on the front. I remember like it was yesterday. But it was never used. It was just, hey, mom, I'm playing baseball. Where's my birth certificate? In the Bible. All right, I'll go find the Bible. And what am I looking for? My birth certificate. No, look at you pull out the Bible, it will really tell you where you came from. You're created in the image of God. And it all starts and ends with him. It needs to take center stage. There's just something that happens when we study the Bible and like the early church, there's something special that happens when we study the Bible together. It's great to dig in alone, but it's also great to come together. Like right now, you are investing your time. You may not view church attendance or being in a church service as investing your time, but that's what it is. God has given you time. You're choosing what to use, what to do with it. And your investment in time, I take seriously. And the time that I have you, I don't want to talk to you about the latest movie. I don't want to play all these clips up here. I don't want your attention anywhere else but God's word for your life. God's word for your life. That is one of the reasons, by the way, because I get asked from time to time, Pastor Ed, Pastor Ed, the church we came from, they used to give us these little handouts where I could just fill in the blanks when you're teaching. And you hear you just tell us to take notes, and I have no idea to write what to write down. And I'll tell you why we don't give you the little outlines. I'm not opposed to them. I get them. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of using that tool uh, in this series, right? Giving you four things to write down and learning well. But the reason I don't give you those notes and train, because I don't want to train you to listen to me for the one word that goes in the blank. Because once you get the word, then what else are you going to listen to? But rather, I want to train you. I want you to be trained to be in a church that says, bring your Bible, use your Bible, get a piece of paper out, get a pen. If you don't have one, we have them for you. And just write down what you hear and what you believe God's telling you. We'll write down what, what some significant thing. Just There's no right way to take notes. There's no right way to take notes. But I'll tell you this. When you do take notes, that's another way to retain something another way to learn something, another way to receive God's word. And I don't want you listening. Okay, Ed, I see on the notes today there's five words. Did I get all five words? I, I don't know. I don't even know from service to service if I would repeat the same five words all the time because the s messages are different because the room is always different. Same notes, same text, different message. Why? Because the spirit of God is moving differently in every service here. It's amazing what God does. Be in the word, church. The first and important principle of the early church is that their habit was to be in the word of God. Preaching and teaching is God's primary way of reaching the lost and discipling the saved. Teaching and preaching are two different things. Just for a very simple definition, teaching is for believers where you're in a posture of learning about the character and nature of God. Preaching is for unbelievers where they learn about the character and nature of their own life being separate from God. That's why the primary focus of this pulpit is not preach, 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 because most people listening are, are already saved. People that are saved need to be taught. Ephesians chapter 4, the pastor teacher's responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Preaching is for the unsaved. Like today, if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, you need your sins forgiven. God loved you so much, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is a preaching type of message. And preaching is for the unsaved. In a moment, you'll have an opportunity to make that decision. In the church, we need an anointed preaching and teaching with an emphasis upon teaching. The part of the believer is to receive. So the pastor teaches, but a healthy church listens. The pastor speaks, a healthy church listens, and then the Holy Spirit brings growth. So use the Bible. As Greg Glory said, we're to declare a known God to a world that does not know him. A known God to a world that does not know him. And it's from him that I got this acronym, WELL. I love it. I'll remember it forever. 
worship, evangelistic, learning, and loving. That, those are the elements of a strong church. And as we go through this study together in the next three studies, we'll grow more and more in these elements of a healthy, well-balanced church. So Father, we, we pray today uh, that things will come to, to light. Maybe just again, a stirring of a commitment to your word, <clears throat> a stirring of being men and women that continue steadfastly, that the habit of our life is to be in your word. Thank you for giving us the whole fullness of the Bible so that we can read it from cover to cover. And even in those difficult sections and those things hard to understand, that we wouldn't dismiss the things that are easy to understand because a few things are hard. A few things are challenging. And thank you for allowing us, God, and mandating us to be a teaching church, to teach the word without apology, without a hesitation, <clears throat> with humility and brokenness, patience and long-suffering toward one another. Because our hearts, I, we really want to be a, make a difference in this community, God. We really do want to have our lives used by you to live out your meaning and purpose in us and through us. And so we yield ourselves afresh and anew today in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.